Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, April 17th organizational meeting of the City of River Falls Common Council. First thing we'll do is stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. We have a roll call, please. Beerstead. Here. Downing. Here. Gagne. Here. Morissette. Here. Odine. Here. Page. Here. Watson. Here. Okay, then I'd just like to note, everybody, everybody know that the four elect, newly effect, elected officials have all took the oaths. They would be me, my Dan Tolan, uh, Alderman Scott Larson, Alderman Allen. Or Scott Larson. <laughs> <laughs> no, I need to be here anymore? Or? I don't know where that came from. That'd be Scott Morissette, excuse me, uh, Michael Page, and Todd Beerstead. Okay, we'll next move on to uh, this is where we'll uh, have nominations for the president and the comptroller. We'll do president first. Mr. Mayor, I move to nominate Mr. Morissette for president. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Next, we'll do comptroller. Mr. Mayor, I nominate uh, Ms. O'Dean as Comptroller. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And then, uh, Diane, it's up to you to appoint. Um, I'd like to appoint Mr. Watson as the uh, Deputy Comptroller. Okay. Mr. Watson it is. Okay. Um, then, I'm, then back to Diane. I'm, I'll reappoint Diane as my parliamentarian. And then um, we'll go on to a nomination for plan commission. Mr. Mayor, I move that we appoint Scott Morissette for plan commission. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, next I'll read off my list of who I'm appointing to which um, boards. Let's see, Emergency Medical Services Advisory Board, uh, Mr. Watson. Uh, Historic Preservation Commission, Mr. Page. Library Board will be Mr. Gagne. Parks and Rec Advisory Board will be Mr. Downing. Uh, Design Review Committee will be Mr. Gagne. Utility Advisory Board will be Mrs. O'Dean. And the Housing Authority will be Mr. Beerstead. And now you guys can vote on that. Oh, Mr. Mayor, I make a motion. We uh, confirm your appointments. Second. Oh, I'm sorry. Just <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, next move on to other city officials. Uh, I recommend that we Appoint Weldon Riley as our city attorney, and Dan Gustafson is usually our attorney here representing them. Um, should, I get, should I do each one of these separately, or can I do them all at once? Oh, okay. We'll go on to that then. Okay, so, yep. We'll do the resolution appointing Weldon Riley as city attorneys. Mr. So, Mayor, yep. I go make ahead, a sir. motion we uh, appoint Weld Riley uh, SC as the city attorney. Second. Uh, any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, next uh, I would reappoint uh, Nate Cross as a city forester. And I'll entertain a motion on that one. I'll motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And for health officer this year, we're going to use Pierce, Pierce and St. Croix County Health Department as our health officers. Make a motion. We appoint uh, Pierce, Saint, uh, Pierce and St. Croix Health Departments as our health officer. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Next we'll go a resolution uh, designating <coughs> public depositories. For uh, This will be for the public monies held by the City of River Falls. These will be the different financial institutions that we use. I will entertain a motion on that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> I move um, approval of the resolution designating public depositories for public monies held by the City of River Falls. Second. Questions or comments? I need to abstain from voting on this as uh, my employer has been added to the list of potential depositories, so I'll please mark me as abstain. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Then we're going to have a review of the open meeting laws with our, with our attorney, Dan Gustafson. up to 
after that, can we review and approve the 2018 City Council workshop and a special meeting schedule? Oh, yes. Number 12. Oh, yeah, we skipped that. Item 12, we missed item 12. Mm -hmm. Last page in your packet. Oh, sorry, I was reading an old, an old. Uh, this is new. In the past, we haven't. In the past, you've just kind of. Told us. <laughs> Christy and I set the meetings, but we thought that you ought to get a schedule as long as we had one put together and make sure that the council's in agreement yep. and then we can post them as official. Okay. I mean, we would post them anyways, but this will allow us to have them regularly scheduled and hopefully give the council plenty of advance notice to that time. Okay, so we'll go back to comments if there is pro concerns or okay. other things. Is everybody okay with that schedule? Do you promise not to add any meetings to it? <laughs> <laughs> No. no. <laughs> hey, Christy, have we sent out invites for all of these yet or not? Okay. And a lot of these are prior to council meetings, correct? Mm -hmm. All of them. All of them. All of them. Yeah. Yep. That's good for me. On the, on the Tuesday. And the council. feedback I've received in the past is that you prefer not to have um, multiple days. The Another third night. or alternate. Uh, I'm sorry, not the third. Let's see, the, the second or the fourth um, Tuesdays used. No, now I'm getting confused. First the first and third. I was right the first time. You prefer us not to use the first and third Tuesdays for workshops, that you'd rather have the workshops um, on the same day as council. So first, first, yeah. first Tuesdays usually. Yeah, that's Tuesdays. always planning commission. Yep. So, so yep. Um, Everybody okay with that? Yes. We do, we do have a tentative date. Do you have that offhand? No. Um, it's the school board's um, turn, so to speak, to host the joint city council school board meeting and typically the hosting place has it at their site and on their their meeting night so that would be a monday i believe i think is the third monday in june um that we're talking about having that meeting but we hadn't have it confirmed yet so no let you know as soon as that's available okay and that, it must not be june 12th it must be a different date because that's cip for us Maybe it's the 11th. Any other, anybody have any other questions about these? No? Okay, we can move on. I'll move to approve the council workshop and special meeting schedule. Second. All in favor of this schedule? Aye. Aye. Okay. okay, Dan. Hello. I'd like to thank you for uh, appointing Weld Riley and uh, myself as city attorney for another year. Um, I put a copy of about a 20 page outline next to each of your microphones and it outlines um, <clears throat> both open meetings and ethics law and some just general organizational things in the beginning. Um, I'm not planning on going through this entire 20 page outline. I'm sure that you'd all rather be doing other things than listening to the attorney speak tonight. So, uh, and I think most of you have heard me give a similar presentation or my predecessor uh, in the past with the exception of Michael. So I'm gonna try and keep this brief, but I was asked to touch on a few highlights and um, you're always welcome to contact me if you have questions about open meetings law, public records law, ethics or, or other uh, things covered in the outline. Um, so you are the uh, city council of the city of River Falls. You're comprised of the seven alder persons and the mayor. Um, and uh, there's some general information about the organization, the council, and, and the way it works. In, in River Falls, four members of the council constitutes a quorum. Um, in, under the statutes, most cities require a two-thirds majority for a, a quorum, but because River Falls has a charter ordinance that sets its uh, quorum requirement at four, um, you're able to differ from the statute with a charter ordinance. Um, open, um, all council meetings are open meetings, as I'm sure you know. Um, the open meetings law, as well as the public records law and the ethics laws that I'm going to be talking about appear in um, primarily in, in chapter 19 of the statutes. <coughs> um, the, um, in terms of open meetings, you know that whenever you're here, it's an open meeting and it requires public notice and the agenda is printed in the paper. Um, you should be aware, though, that 
even outside of this room, you don't ever want to be discussing city business uh, in the hallway with four of you, for example, because that you have a you then have a, a majority, essentially a quorum of the council. You can also uh, there's also a, a, a further restriction on council members discussing things that's that comes into play because of something called a walking quorum, and that means that if you know, two of you talk about something and then one of those people talks to another and another, you know, you can end up essentially constituting a quorum through these successive meetings. So the general rule is that you shouldn't discuss city business outside of a public meeting uh, with, you know, a, a group of people. You shouldn't be essentially like planning what you're going to do in advance of a, of a public meeting. Um, I was asked um, to comment also a little bit on um, the public records law and um, in particular uh, email practice by council members. Um, the Wisconsin public records law also appears in chapter 19 in sections 19.31 uh, to 19.39. Um, like the open records law which is broadly construed and and favors um, making sure that all business of the city occurs in, in an open meeting. Um, the Wisconsin Public Records Law has a presumption that uh, it shall be construed in every instance with a presumption of complete public access consistent with the conduct of government business. Uh, the denial of public access generally is contrary to the public interest and only in an exceptional case may access be denied. So. There's really under Wisconsin law a broad presumption that if anything that constitutes a public record under the law is requested by a citizen, the city needs to provide it to them. Um, that includes um, a wide range of things that you might not necessarily think of as a public record. Record is defined in the statute to include any material on which written, drawn, printed, spoken, visual or electromatic in, uh, electromagnetic information or, elec or electronically generated or stored data is recorded or preserved regardless of physical form or characteristics which has been created or is being kept by an authority. Now an authority is defined um, in the law uh, quite broadly as well to constitute a, you know, a state or local office, elective official like all of you, uh, agency, board, commission, committee, council, department, or public body, corporate or politic. Um, and so it's a broad definition of who is an authority and what is a record. That means that if you have email correspondence, for example, with one of your constituents on some matter related to city business, that's a public record. And I've been asked to remind you that you are all provided with city email accounts and that it's really a, a strong recommendation that you try to keep all city related emails on that city email account rather than on a personal account. If we ever have a public record request that implicates something that you did on your personal email, as I think a couple, two, three of you may have <laughs> found out in the past, it's a lot easier if that's all on your city email account and um, the city can then search your emails, find the things that are relevant to that request and produce them uh, to the member of the public that's requesting them. Whereas if you, you know, if you had conversations with somebody on a Gmail account or something like that, it can be a lot more difficult to comply with the law and uh, respond to <coughs> such a request. So, and I'm sorry for yeah. interrupting, but I got a question about that sure. particular point. Sure. From time to time, I've gotten emails at my on my personal email, right? And I've replied to them, said, you know, please send it to this address. Yeah. And then I've taken that email and forwarded it to my city account. Right. Am I opening up myself for somebody saying, aha, if he if if that went to his personal one, uh, what else went there? And now I want to dig into his personal one as well. Is that do I do I open the door? that way not not necessarily I mean if 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 you get an email and you immediately forward it and ask them to correspond with you on your um, city email I think the practice that I would recommend is to actually forward the email to your 
city email and then respond from that email address. That's probably the best way to do it. That's probably the best practice. But just by virtue of forwarding something from your personal email to your city email, I don't think you necessarily open up your personal email account to, you know, searching as long as you as long as you follow that practice and you send any emails from your city account. I know that happens because you know you people know you in the community and they may have your personal email account and so you know they may send it to that one and and you need to respond but it's best to do that from your city account. Yeah, my, my bigger concern is that they send it to my employer's email. Right. And I open up my employer to <laughs> right. a problem and right. that's would not be good. I, yeah, it wouldn't. It wouldn't necessarily open up your employee, your employer's files, but you might be obligated to go search your email then at work and find those. Whereas, you know, if it's on your city account, the city staff could help you with that. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Sure. So that's just a, a reminder that, to the extent possible, try and keep all city-related correspondence on your city email account. Um, in terms of the ethics laws, um, I've asked been to, be, to touch on that as well. And this starts at um, page 14 in the outline I gave you. Um, <clears throat> I won't go through this in great detail, but as public officials, you are subject, local public officials, you are subject to um, both the ethics <clears throat> provisions in the uh, municipal ordinances and to the uh, ethics law at the state level. Again, that's found in um, chapter 19 and prim primarily in, in sections 19.41 to 19.59. <clears throat> um, the thing I want to stress here is that whenever you have a conflict of interest um, where you think something that you're doing at, as in your role as a city council member may have an impact on, uh, could have an impact, or in particular, uh, could have some financial, uh, implicate some financial interest of yours, like Scott did tonight when, when you were approving depositories, he disclosed that he works for a bank and that his bank is on the list and then he uh, abstained from the vote. And I think that's, you know, that's the best practice. The, the um, ordinance, uh, section 2.28.060 actually requires any member of the city council who has a financial or personal interest in any proposed legislation before the council uh, shall disclose on the records of the council the nature and extent of such interest. Now, in this particular case, it wasn't really legislation, but, but you know, I, w I, would, I would err on the side of disclosure of any conflict and on abstaining if you think you might have some personal interest in a matter that comes before the council. How do you define personal interest? <laughs> Good question. I don't believe that either the statute or the ordinances <laughs> defines that. But if you would, uh, you know, stand to gain from something, and in all of these in kinds of- In a personal of, way. In correct. a personal way, correct. Um, in your, and, uh, yeah, in and your it, personal capacity. Go yeah, ahead. And my understanding is it needs to be more than just, you know, it benefits my neighborhood or, Right. Or the city. It's in some particular way, usually financially. Usually financially, that's true. But I, you know, I can imagine something where it's hard to define an, a dollar amount, but you might still be gaining from, right. from it. In the past, I was on the chair, I was the ch uh, chairman of the, of the Chamber of Commerce one year. And any time that something with regard to the Chamber of Commerce came through, I abstained because of the perceived perception. I, right. I gained nothing from it. I, right. I was not compensated, but there was a perception there. Right. Uh, but once I stopped being chair and I was still on the board, I, then I yeah. voted on those things because I, I, I felt that that was kind of the differentiator. But and and I sit on nonprofits. We all sit on you know organizations that are in the community. And the question I think that we're all kind of wondering is, how do we? Right, and some some of the <clears throat> ethics laws do specifically say a personal interest or an interest of an organization you are associated with. So it, it, it depends on the specific provision in, in the law, but some do say that. In general, I guess, and and I, you know Scott's comment pointed this out. That was a good comment, but um, there's 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 kind of two levels to think about here. There's um, 
things that personally benefit you where there's a clear prohibition on, on taking action as a council member that would benefit you, particularly in a financial way. But then there's a question of sort of, attorneys always use this term, uh, an appearance of impropriety. Uh, and I think if, you're, uh, if you want to be extremely careful, you should disclose things, even if there might just be an appearance that somehow you'd be gaining uh, from an action of the council. So I would, you know, you know, feel free to, again, ask a question if you're not sure, but uh, I, would, I would tend to err on over-disclosure of things rather than under-disclosure. Um, the, specifically, the, on page 16, there's a list of prohibited conduct uh, under the ethics code. Uh, it, and I, I won't um, read these whole things, but use of a public position to obtain financial gain is one of the things that is pro prohibited, or anything of substantial value. Now, these, these are qualified, and I've, I've, um, I've also attached as exhibits A and B to my outline a couple of guidance documents that are produced by the Wisconsin Ethics <coughs> Commission that talk specifically about local officials receiving things of value. And the second one is a, um, is a guide that's it's actually titled Citizen's Guide, but it, I, I thought it included some good information that might be helpful, so I've, I've attached that as well. Um, I won't go into great detail here. Be aware that starting on page 18 of the outline, there's also um, provisions that are a little more serious. They, certain actions can actually constitute a felony under the law. Those would generally be uh, sort of intentionally or refusing to, to do a duty that, that's required by you under the law or to, um, or to knowingly um, you know, enter into a contract, uh, negotiate a contract on behalf of a private interest when you're also um, making a decision on behalf of the, the city or um, uh, participating in the making of a contract in which you have a pecuniary interest. So those things can actually rise to the level of a felony under uh, Chapter 946 of the law. Um, I think that's all I wanted to touch on in detail. If anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer them or feel free to you know, contact me if you have questions at a later time. Okay, anybody have any questions for Dan? Okay, thanks Dan. All right, thanks. Okay, move on to, uh, we're gonna have a little report on organizational updates. Assuming that'll be Scott. Sure, Mayor and Council, um, the, uh, I'm sorry, not the statute, the ordinance on the city administrator and my job description includes a number of functions and duties as expected of the, the city administrator and or his designees. Um, I just want to touch on a little bit. This item is something that the council on, um, and I have agreed to kind of put on the agenda each year um, just to kind of understand if we're still working in the same um, operational model that you'd like me to. Um, so there's a couple of things that I'm required to do under the ordinance. Um, one of them is to create a plan of administration, otherwise known as an organizational chart. Um, the, the ordinance doesn't say how often or frequent or when we should present that to you, it just says it should be presented to the council. So we've presented that to you um, on an annual basis for four or five years now. Um, in the past, it was loosely presented in the budget document. and and then there's been a series of memos, um, organizational meetings and, and other meetings where we've kind of defined roles that you expect me to take on the personnel side of things. So I want to talk about those a little bit too. The city operates without, you know, it's a council of the whole. We operate without a personnel or finance separate committees. So you've assigned a lot of the financial and personnel duties um, to officers of the cities, in particular myself. Um, some of those, though, have been assigned to the treasurer or other, other uh, named roles within the city, just like you did the city forester today. So there's a number of things in Wisconsin statute that have specific roles for specific people, and then the city has a number of ordinances that assign certain duties to the city engineer, the forester, and others. Um, and then you kind of try to wrap it up with a city administrator ordinance to, to say, 
but at the end of the day, you really want to hold one person accountable f for the kind of that day-to-day -day operation, as you call it, in the ordinance. So the plan of administration is one duty I have. Um, the, the, I'm also named as or serve as the personnel officer, which is, among other things, sets wage and salary s scales for the city um, in, in um, collaboration with the council. That has been, I've been directed in the past by the council to just do that. So when we did the, the overall pay plan, the council approved that, and then the council said, we expect the, administ the ongoing administration of this, meaning setting people in the pay plan, reclassifying people, um, setting uh, raises and other um, bonuses and things, that's the administrator. So I just want to remind you that we don't bring every pay classification, every salary change, um, to, um, every promotion to the council. Um, we report on it after with this plan of administration, um, and certainly I keep you up to date as I can through one-on-ones and, and the official council meetings with the administrator notes. Um, the, the personnel section of the ordinance for administrator says that I'm to recommend um, to council the appointment, promotion, supervision, or, or suspension or termination of department heads. The council has indicated in the past and the current operating um, model is that you also expect me to handle the, the administration of the department head staffing decisions. So um, you've delegated that, um, that responsibility to me. So again, every year I just remind the council kind of how the personnel works, make sure that that's satisfactory to the council as a whole and then we go forward from there. Um, we also have Memorandums of understanding with the library and the court, which have some special statutory treatment on matters, matters of personnel, and particularly the, the municipal judge and the library director have specific responsibilities and authorities um, for the direction of their staff within those departments. Again, the council has asked that we coordinate that and that we essentially operate as one city to the extent possible and to the extent that the library director, um, in this case the library board, um, and the municipal court judge are willing to operate that way. And in the past they have been, and they've, they've uh, um, suggested they will continue to do so. So the library, I think we, I don't know when the last time we signed the MOU, but the library board basically delegated personnel responsibilities as you have to the city administrator and their designees. In the case of the uh, municipal court, there's a little more nuance. The judge retains their overall authority in, but the expects that the administration day-to-day -day advice and all that is coming from um, the administrator and the city clerk. And that, the, you know, proving time off and doing some of the things that a supervisor would do is done by the clerk because they're here every day. Um, but the judge gets to maintain that ability to kind of oversee things overall. And then you've added that you did in 1999, and I don't, I should have looked to see if this was a charter. I can't remember if the administrator is a charter ordinance or it's, or it's just, just a regular ordinance. Um, but in 1999, um, when you set up the administrator ordinance at that time, um, you put in a cooperation clause, which all administrators like to see, um, which basically goes through all these different people's roles. And it says the fire chief can do this, and the library director does this, and, every, and then it says... Um, all officials and employees um, shall cooperate with and assist the city administrator um, so that the government shall function effectively and efficiently. So that's kind of the legal authority that allows us to kind of cross some of these gray areas and coordinate our activities. Um, certainly I'm cognizant of the law. I'm very well aware of the different um, kind of meanings and responsibilities that are given. Um, but there also is the council's ability to delegate um, authority like the appointment of a department head or, frankly, the suspension of a department head. Um, that has been conducted by my office without prior approval. Um, the primary break on that or the, um, obviously we have a professional HR department and an HR director that advises me. Um, but the mayor as the executive of the city, um, legal executive of the city, certainly has more personnel information than the council as a whole. So um, I cannot think of a time in my tenure where we've terminated somebody without the mayor being aware 
that that was going to happen and have, frankly, the opportunity to, to, to veto it or say, what are you doing? That doesn't make sense. So we don't go out to all seven of the council members and say, this is what we're about to do and here's all the reasons why and, and do you agree with that? Um, that's a responsibility that I've taken on on your behalf. So the council can take that back um, at, at a time that they're wanting to do that and they certainly um, have the ability to do so, but I'm happy to take on that responsibility and, and frankly it's shared um, heavily with uh, uh, Karen Berg's from our HR director um, but I just want to every year we just try to at the organizational meeting update the council so that you understand how I feel I'm operating on the personnel matters and so that you can have a chance to say we're not comfortable with that level of authority um, otherwise we're happy to continue to do that and I'll I do my best to uh, operate the city efficiently and effectively um, and certainly on personnel matters, um, we know that uh, there, there's going to be things that come up throughout the year, and we try to be flexible and um, react um, when we have to, but we are obviously proactive and try to plan ahead so that we give the council and everybody else as long a view as possible, but there's things in the employment market sometimes we we make decisions to hire people in and do things as, as rapidly as we can. Generally, we follow the plan of administration. Um, there's not much variation. I think the council members that have been on for a long time can attest that, you know, we generally have the plan. We primarily stick to the plan, but we also know that there's always retirements or other things, um, un unexpected re resignations and things, and then we we always evaluate that vacancy to determine what the best way forward um, is for the for the city. So that is the plan of administration and uh, review of the uh, organizational updates. Um, and then we usually do something. Um, I can't remember. If we do that in the middle of the year. Sometimes we've included it with this. It just kind of gives you a list of people have come and gone. So we try to do that on a regular basis in the administrator's report, um, but then we usually put it all on one list. Um, but we, you know, we add and subtract a lot of employees throughout the year, um, typically at their, um, their wishes. So when I, when I say that, add and subtract, if we have a seasonal employee that works for us at the pool as a lifeguard, we add, they have to be added in as an employee each year and then they resign and so that then they're subtracted out each year so the the report of kind of movement in and out is is pretty long but I will we will provide that to the council so they can kind of see all the names attached to the different movements so I'd be happy to take any questions the org chart I think we at we added a, a year or two ago we had a request to add the actual names of the employees rather than positions which I think is helpful for you as council people to kind of see the different names with the positions. Um, and you'll notice there's some vacant positions. And then we always try to give the council an idea of which ones we actually think we're gonna hire. Cause like I said, every time we get a vacancy, we don't necessarily fill it right away. Um, so the, the positions in green are the areas where we expect to be filling. And in fact, I think some of those actually have already been filled by press time, so to speak. So. Um, If I, may ask uh, I think question. water and wait I think we did uh, get an accepted job offer yeah. on water wastewater but the rest of those are actually still open yep. Go ahead. if I may ask a question um, you know seeing that we're talking about the organizational plan here and and some of the staffing I think we talked about this in in our one-on-one -on -one. I get questions from folks asking what what are these odd um, administrative positions that we're adding and are we getting too top heavy can you give some clarification for the folks at home if kind of what we've done in the in the last couple of years here with the organizational plan sure um, I can I can attempt to answer that I think you know that the top heavy I guess is a perspective you know that's subject to everybody's judgment um, and your feedback as a council on others when we do the budget um, generally speaking um, we have added positions we have substantially focused on uh, direct service or line what used to be called line employees so I think um, 
in the case of uh, management, which would be kind of the top on the, the org chart, is probably the t top couple layers of uh, boxes, um, even though it doesn't actually always equate to two layers of management, but th those folks in the management team and supervisory level, um, those positions generally have stayed the same or shrunk by one or two FTE. Um, and then the um, direct service positions have probably increased seven, seven to nine positions over uh, the last couple of years. So um, both by initiative of the city administrator and also by the council in the case of police officers. So we've, we've added a number of um, direct service positions and in the case recently, a recent example is uh, the vacancy, the retirement of our longtime um, operations superintendent. We chose not to replace a management position there. An existing manager took on those responsibilities, and then we hired a line, our direct service employee, um, to the to the city. So I think you've seen that. There's there's been some moving around within the police department, but generally speaking, we don't have more. Um, an incredibly top-heavy um, system there. It's it's become more top-heavy in River Falls than what we've had historically, but we're still quite a bit less top-heavy than um, than most departments of our size. With that many sworn officers, we usually have lieutenants and captains and other positions that we don't have. We have chief deputy chief and sergeants and and so there has been mm -hmm. on an org chart basis i think we've gotten a little more top heavy there um but our sergeants are working sergeants so i guess that's subject to to debate too and then certainly we've added a lot of ems direct service personnel mm -hmm. so that's been one area where we've added a lot of employees direct service employees over the last seven eight years i don't know if that answers your question yeah or, i think it does and it kind of sums up what we talked about in our meeting and it's just a, a concern that some folks when I knock on their doors and I talk to them about the community and you know they talk about these new positions that are coming out and and, and they're concerned that we're getting too top heavy but they don't get to sit and look at a, a nice chart that we get to look at and look at the spreads and look at all the different positions that we eliminate and consolidate and yeah, as, so as I think the, you do a good job of that. Thank you as the council knows we we are adding adding positions all the time there's typically a subtraction on the other end of that. So it's, uh, hey, now they're recruiting for this new position we've never heard of. Mm -hmm. But there's also positions that were eliminated. Um, and frankly, it is driven by somewhat by the just general population increase. But I think we've done a good job of putting our positions where our priorities were. So as the, co as the, the council has set priorities, we staff to those priorities. So we do have a fair amount of staff right now in um, working on economic development. And then we've talked now about a specific position for economic development. Um, but I think that you can kind of follow the strategic plan and see where the staffing is going. At least that's the goal anyways. If I could add just one more thing on that. Um, you know, yeah, we have delegated historically to the city administrator um, on the position of hiring, firing um, people throughout the, the city. Um, one thing I'd like to just caution though is if we do um, look outside of just a recruitment and we ever go to any kind of a contract uh, basis of any kind, I'd like to make sure that always comes back to the council so we're going to get a, a better look at it outside of just maybe just hiring, say, someone like Karen for her position. Um, and we can't find somebody for that position and we're gonna go outside of that. It would, it'd be nice for it to come back to the council so we have a better idea of what that's gonna look like. Um, that would be my thought at least. And, and the council gets that by default if the contract is over 50,000. Um, right now, I guess I can't think of a situation that would happen, but well, I, yeah, I can actually. Um, building inspector we just did a contract for about 15,000 so that one didn't come to the council because it was under 50,000 and it was in what I thought was within the purview of <clears throat> of me trying to organize the uh, the the plan of administration um, but if we were to contract for um, I'm trying to think of an example that doesn't get people excited to think there's a plan but um, <laughs> so I won't say if there was another department department head X and that person left and I wanted to fill the position with a, con a contractor or consultant 
um, the 50,000 threshold would likely bring it in front of you. Um, that's just my concern and, you know, I don't know where the rest of the council sits on that, but that's at least my, my thoughts. Um, okay. go, ahead. go ahead now. Uh, I was wondering if Mr. Simpson could just speak to the differences between the library board and the police and fire commission relative to the other uh, boards. They're called out and I believe they have some level of independence. It looks like. Sure. I mean, I'll give you the, sent to or whatever those but certainly um and if it's not enough i can give you more but um so police and there's certain entities that are created within the statutes and then they're typically they're replicated in the ordinances but even if they weren't in the ordinances there would they would still be in the statutes so that they would have some some authority um just briefly the library board in generic legal terms you give them the bag of money and they get to do what they want with it um, but there's you know in the federal government it's called per string federalism which when when the federal government wants the drinking age to be 21 transportation. they tell state transportation departments that if you don't change your drinking age to 21 we're going to take back your highway money so legally the library board can do whatever they want with the money they're in total control of the building and the operations of the library from a practical standpoint they always have to coordinate with the council the council could say we don't like the way you're spending <coughs> money we're going to not give you that money. Now there's also some statutory language that has maintenance of service effort. So you, you couldn't just yank all their money away because you've got some rules about that because they don't want you to just take it away. But essentially they have more independent authority than other committees that are more advisory in nature. Um, and again, this library board, which was something that was in place before I became the administrator, the library board and the council had decided that we needed a little bit more formality to our cooperation. Um, we need to make sure we really are cooperating. Um, and so we have the MOU because the library board could essentially have their own payroll person. They could pay their own accounts receivable. They could go out and get their own credit cards. They could, if they wanted to do that, it doesn't make a lot of, it's not very efficient, um, but they certainly could do that. And there are, there are libraries in Wisconsin that operate that independently. Um, and and the, the city council just says, here's here's this amount of money and do your thing. And we don't, we don't want to do, we don't have anything to do with that. Um, but here the library gets allocations for overhead insurance, HR, all that stuff like a regular department. Police and Fire Commission has a much narrower and more specific role to do with promotion um, and discipline of officers and the hiring and firing of the police chief and the fire chief. Um, once you get to a certain size, and I can't remember if it's 4,000 or there's a threshold, you have to have a police and fire commission. So we're, I mean, we're big enough, we have to have a fire, I think it might be 10,000 actually, because um, there was a point in River Falls history where it kind of crossed the line. And then there's things called optional powers for police and fire commission which the city council can permissively give the police and fire commission over and above the minimum. We have not done that. That's not often done in Wisconsin. Um, so the police and fire commission has those, those things. So they work on things like, is the recruitment and selection process for a police officer fair, equitable, and non-discriminatory? They can have some influence in the actual process that the police chief uses to hire at the end of the day, the police chief has his own statute. And so he says, hey, this is my territory. I get to decide this, this, this. But there's prescription in the statute that says, here's how the police and fire commission provides those candidates. And then the police chief picks what, what he wants. Um, and the only body that I'm aware of that can hire and fire officially a fire chief or police chief in, in River Falls is the police and fire commission. So. 
if any one of you or myself were upset with the performance of the fire chief and police chief, obviously we go through, we work together collaboratively to try to resolve that. If it reaches a level where, where we can't do that, then I have to file charges, formal charges with the police and fire commission or a council member or the mayor would file former charge, <coughs> file charges to do that. So when I just gave you the overview on how we do personnel, there's, there's nuances galore in the state law for mm -hmm. all different kinds of positions. <coughs> um, and like we emphasize in the memo, the city attorney works for you but he also works with me on projects, but ultimately he's, he is a direct employee. I am your direct employee. Most other employees are not your direct employees. They're, they have statutory or other uh, assignment as far as who their, their, their uh, direct is. Um, the library board has the nuance of their library board employees, but they're really city employees too, and that's been discussed in the statutes and case law and all kinds of things for on and on, so. Scott, do you wanna to touch on council, or the lack of council members sitting on the police and fire? I think that's the only committee in the city that we don't have a council rep on. So statutorily, you're prohibited, <coughs> a, a city official is prohibited from being on the police and fire commission, so. Even if you wanted to have a council person on the police and fire commission, you, you may not. Um, in the past, it's been on again, off again for this council that I've worked with. Um, sometimes you've had what you consider a liaison. So it's like somebody who's assigned to go to the meeting. You, you can't, you're not allowed to participate in the discussions or if they go into closed session as a police and fire commission, you're not allowed to be in the closed session um, so, so police and fire commission is somewhat insulated. But we hold appointment power through the mayor's appointment and confirmation through the council. Correct. And housing authority has a similar, um, separation. I would say that they're best described as a kind of a wholly owned subsidiary with a, with a pretty separate operating agreement. So. They're not a close vest operating subsidiary. They don't have the same health plan. They don't, their employees right now are not considered city employees. They're considered housing authority. They've got separate IRS um, things and they're not considered any longer, I don't believe, a component unit for financial uh, statements. So um, there's, I mean, we could probably talk about 90 other things, but um, you've hit on some really good ones that are definitely different. Um, but we still have a vision, and the council's been clear to me and in our strategic plan of one city. So we still try to operate like we are all under the same roof and working for the same thing, um, regardless of what department you're in and regardless of the statutory treatment of your office um, because we you know city clerk has statutory treatment and separate you know Ms. White could tell me I'm not going to do that because this is what the statute says I'm going to do um, and we don't typically have those problems here um, because we cooperate and try to get it done but they you know I'm cognizant of their responsibility on their statute too um, there's there's things that they are responsible for um, and then I am only indirectly responsible for because ultimately you hold me accountable but there's some of my employees have statutory language that says you shall you must you will um, and so I'm trying to, I try to be respectful of that too Scott <clears throat> you said uh, not every pay uh, class and salary change comes before the council what would or has triggered uh, involving the council in the past? Um, wholesale change has certainly triggered the council. Um, that's the, the latest kind of pay plan changes. And then we also brought, I believe we brought to the council the, we had a pay plan in place and we had a process to increase the pay to update it um, with market data and when we did that we brought that to the council so I think we moved 
we did a survey and I think it was 10% market improvement over a three year or four year period. And so when we kind of shifted everything up, I believe that came to the council. Um, I don't know if anybody's shaking their head. Yes, yes that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was with the, the four steps and then the mirror. Yeah. But, you know, frankly, that's probably the limit. Of, I mean, we've done promotions without them coming to the council. Um, we certainly have done um, some bonuses. And when I talk about bonuses, a lot of times those are $100 or $250 bonuses for some special project or something. Um, we, we do pay reclassifications all the time. Um, it's a responsibility of the HR department to make sure we're paying fair and equitably. Um, and that they're, so they're constantly monitoring internal and external equity, um, including pay equity amongst um, classes of employees. So we certainly don't want to find ourselves in a situation where um, male employees in similar positions have negotiated a better pay historically. So they're, they've got better pay for a position. Um, and so that Karen brings those kind of things up and says, here's, you know, we need to make an adjustment. Um, when we have new hires come in, so like this economic development position, it'll be classed um, by the HR department. They'll use the same guide that the consultants used when they first did it. And then I'll have to sign off on that. Um, that doesn't come to the council. Um, and then whenever we get a request, employees can request a reclass. That's very infrequent. I can't think of yeah I we don't have an active employee group group of employees that are constantly annually asking that their positions get reclassed so we're we're doing a dozen reclasses a year maybe or not even anymore it's we've kind of come to a pretty good equilibrium the employees understand the system pretty well and and people feel it's pretty fair so that's if there is a new policy um, is the council notified of the policy change or adaptation um, you're notified um, because you are essentially an employee of the city so you get some notification when we do just what I consider minor personnel changes okay. um, something like the PTO policy there was obviously it's on the work plan so the council was aware we were kind of doing it um, and then was presented um, presented to the council kind of with room for objection but it still was something I was implementing and uh, how does succession planning uh, play a role as far as um, this goes is that something the council will play a role in more um, the council has provided comment um, and observation when it comes to succession so for example mm -hmm. council members have said to me I'm concerned that we have this long-term employee in this department, and I'm really worried about what's going to happen when when Sam leaves. Um, I, so that's been the primary involvement that council has had. Certainly, your involvement on some of the working committees and advisory committees, you've been able to provide me feedback about. Well, you know, we I really this person is seems really sharp, and I think we should try to find uh, leadership opportunities for them. Um, but succession planning is primarily done um, collaboratively with the executive team in the HR department, trying to identify um, kind of our future, what the future looks like. And then I've brought the, the org, the 2020 org plan. <laughs> I've kind of brought to the council in 2016 or 17 and said, "Here's my crystal ball for today." Um, and I got feedback from the council on that, and then we'll do a 20 on the work plan as a 2025 work plan. So we kind of incorporate the succession so council can see. You know, if I was adding seven firefighters, you would see that in the org plan and be able to provide some some feedback. One of the I had was um, when we bring consultants in, sometimes I think it's easy to bring them in too soon. Um, I don't necessarily know if it's good just let one person decide that sometimes i think you know having the the council more involved with looking at the timing of when you bring a consultant in is just as important as bringing them in so that's the feedback i have on that i would um 
uh, I, I would just reiterate from be, being one of, I guess, one of the senior members on the council <coughs> that um, uh, I feel like you've give, you give us a lot of information about it, but um, I don't see, and I see our um, uh, perspective on uh, personnel issues as being kind of, you know, the umbrella um, approving things on a policy level. Um, but letting uh, the people who work with each other day to day, the people who actually see these, see what's going on, uh, make the decisions. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I will say that when there's um, a, a key position, uh, usually you put someone from the council on the search committee. Um, so I think that's also helpful. Um, I, I, I think that we have great staff and that we can trust them with decisions like when to bring a consultant on. Because I think the staff knows their limitations, knows their time limitations and their um, uh, skill limitations and uh, probably knows better than us when it's appropriate. And you, you have set a purchasing policy that gives you, via the purchasing policy, I know that's not the intent necessarily of the purchasing policy is to ensure your involvement in consultant selection, um, but frankly, it provides a practical tool for you. Because, a check. Because all of the consulting agreements that are 50000 and over are coming to the council because of the purchasing policy. So if I, you know, and I do um, agree to consulting agreements that are less than 50000 and you don't see them, um, Typically, those have been talked about by advisory committees or other things. So. The utility board just yeah. saw one. Well, and I, I think to, to piggyback off Diane's comments, you know, if we, look at, if we look at our interaction with you, I mean, I had my one-on-one -on -one today. We're meeting it with, with you privately at least once a month, and you give us a heads up in those meetings as well as, you know, council meetings and so forth. So I think the communication you know, getting that heads up, even if you don't have to bring it to us, is, is happening. So I'm kind yeah, and, of in the same and, boat as Diane. And, and then we're free to... I'm um, comfortable. Yeah, if we say, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, what are you doing there? Um, then I think we'll let you know. But uh, our role is a policy role, and I don't, for one, I'm, I'm not interested in getting into day-to-day -day management of the city. That's, that's what we hired you for, mm -hmm. and that's where I'm at, but... Yeah. Again, my, yeah. my concern goes back to the consultants in the sense of not necessarily day to day, but just, you know, I want this is make sure that the public's behind a decision before a consultant will start generating consent for any bigger decision. So that's the caution I have with that. And of course, they have a role to play, but you don't want to put the cart before the horse is all I'm saying. So but I get I get down there. I understand the other side of that. And I appreciate yeah. that input, too. And I think most of the consultants are there. We hire the consultants to help us so we can understand to help us talk to the community. You know, these are the decisions we have to make, so, you know. I think the discussion that we're having is, you know, expected given the speed at with which we operate as an organization. So certainly you've, you've provided incredible amount of trust and authority to the staff, um, which I think we've decided is the trade-off is we can get a lot more accomplished as a community, but certainly we're, we need your feedback uh, when we're going too fast or we're going the wrong direction. So I'll continue. And I think we've given that feedback to you. And yeah. Mm -hmm. A couple of items. <laughs> continue to accept. One night was a little tough maybe. But. Continue to accept that feedback with, uh, with a smile and, and, and understand that that's okay. We might, every once in a while we're going to bump into this policy administration discussion or, or just about was that Scott's thing or should that have been the council's and and I'll wait for you guys to yank it back because that that's kind of our relationship is I'd rather have you yanking the reins than whipping me with the stick. So, <laughs> so can I can I ask for a, a general um, kind of definition or description of a consultant and what we would use them for? Yeah, I mean, we use consultants essentially in place of singular staff members. Um, we typically, we, well, we use some singular consultants, but most of the time they're, they're teams or a company that is providing us a, le a level of services. So we've got consultants, um, you know, like uh, for um, the sign traffic studies, we have a, a 
specific person that we use from SEH because the expertise within our engineering staff is not best um, used to generate traffic studies. So we, I would routinely hire them in the range of four to six or four to eight thousand dollars to do different consulting studies. Um, um, they, so they'd be more like an advisory or an educational component. To uh, we we use consultants to to do operational. Um, we have a consulting agreement with our safety uh, risk management, um, yeah. Angelina, and she essentially is. Um, is not just educating or she or giving us advice. She's on boots on the ground working with our employees. So that's that's the exception I would say. Um, but certainly we have a consulting arrangement with Alina Health right now for for the EMS where it's there, David Dave Madison is boots on the ground um, day to day operations. Um, and that was something you brought back to the council, correct? Yes. Um, I believe that that agreement was um, brought to the council. I'm not sure if that actually met the 50,000 threshold or not, but we brought it back anyways. You know, I, I think that's that's a good separation of kind of where we where we go is if, if we're going to hire somebody, say like Dave, um, where it comes to the council, because that's something that's really, um, that's a real policy shift in the city um, for us because that person has direct authority and direction over that entity, um, not just a... Uh, um, kind of a report back to you of, hey, this is what we're doing, this is what I'm seeing. They're actually kind of running that organization. So let alone just giving you kind of information on, on risk management and, and letting you roll with it, there's kind of a separation there or a, a sign study or anything like that. That's a little bit different component. So uh, I'd yeah, like to see that come back to the Yeah, point. I understand, but res respectfully, I, I still am responsible for EMS. So in my in my view, that isn't, I'm not delegating via contract the the authority. I still, if if things go bad, I expect that I'll be responsible for that. So um, we may differ a little bit on that, but I would certainly take direction from the council about changes they want me to make to those kind of decisions. I just think long-term decisions should definitely come back to the council. If it's something like this where you did bring it back to us on Dave, I mean, that was definitely, I think, within within your duties to do that because there was there was a shift of that organization and changes in medical uh, direction and, and a lot of other changes that happened to the internal organization and structure of our community and the services that we offer. So I, I think that's where we should be taking it back. That's just, okay. that's just my opinion. Anybody else got anything else on the organizational meeting or updates? Okay. Scott, do you have anything else? I do not. Okay. Next, we will to set the date for board review. It is set right now for May 31st. That's a Thursday at 11 or at 9 to 11 a.m. And we got to have four of the council members there. As of right now, we have three for sure with Mr. Morissette, Mr. Gagne, and Mr. Downing. So we'll need one more for that date. Is there anything else, Amy, you needed to say about that? Okay. And Amy, we have we've met the criteria for the people yep. who are trained, trained, and done the training. Okay. No, I I can be there. I, I can be oh, there. I'm okay. okay. I'm okay. Mr. Beerstead. Yep. More the merrier. I mean, if yes. We can get yep. I mean, there, more, yeah. yeah I'm happy to okay. As well. Okay. Good. And talk if you want to do the training. Talk to Amy. She'll get you all the fun material. Very good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Mayor, just before you adjourn, um, three quick reminders. April 24th, the workshop at 4.30 for public safety feasibility. That'll be in the training room. Um, the next meeting, Thursday. The meeting Thursday. we affectionately call the Jug Handle Meeting, the State Highway 35 off-ramp into Hoffman, um, is tonight 5 to 7 um, in the training room. And then we are planning to take a group picture right after this meeting, so don't run away, please. Okay. Hmm. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. We are adjourned. I wasn't in an aye. I was in favor of it. <laughs>